situated on the southern shore of Big Payette Lake, amid the mountains of central Idaho and the Pacific Northwest, McCall offers world-class Nordic and Alpine skiing in the winter, and exceptional boating, fishing, and camping in the warmer months, and always uncomparable views. Today, McCall is a thriving, bustling community populated with grape shops, fine restaurants, comfortable hotels, and a mix of year-round and seasonal residents. For centuries, the mountains, the forest, and the remarkable beauty of the setting have attracted homesteaders and visitors to this once remote lakeside location. Originally, Native American tribes of the Nez Perce, the Shoshone, and a subband of the Shoshone, known as the Mountain Sheep Eaters, visited the area surrounding the Payette Lakes to hunt, fish, and prepare for their migration to warmer climates in the winter. Remnants of their long ago presence have been found near the southern shore where the lake water flows into the river. During much of the 19th century, fur trappers roamed the Pacific Northwest collecting valuable pelts from the bountiful forests and streams of the region. One French-Canadian, Francois Payette, traveled and trapped in this area, along with other mountain men who left their mark along the rushing river that flowed from the northern lakes to the Snake River in southern Idaho. Francois Payette would eventually manage Fort Boise in the Idaho Territory and was noted for his generous assistance to travelers through the area. The mountain lakes, the river, a county, and even a town in southwestern Idaho are all named Payette. By 1890, the rough and rugged Idaho Territory officially became the 43rd state in the United States, and Boise was designated the state capital, but much of the newly minted state was and would remain wilderness. Around the same time, Tom and Louisa McCall, four sons and daughter, like others from the East and Midwest, struck out from their farm in Missouri in quest of new opportunities in the developing West. Tom and son Homer preceded the others to check out the landscape in Idaho. Traveling by train from Missouri to Nampa, McCall spent time working the Marsh Ireton Ranch in Montour, near Emmett, while searching for their permanent destination. During that year, Tom heard from some trappers of a place to the north with the most beautiful lake, full of fish, surrounded by aspens and ponderosa pines, mountains and tall grass. Not sure about the winters though, they said. Undaunted and planning his own cattle ranch and new future, Tom determined the high country conditions might work better for cattle raising than the sagebrush terrain of southern Idaho. Unfortunately, prior to setting forth, McCall's younger son, Homer, passed away from a lingering illness. Tom McCall and his family set out from Montour, Idaho, 30 miles northwest of Boise, with other settlers in search of greener pastures, mountains, and the beautiful lake to the north. Traveling north through the small settlements of Sweet Nola, the wagon train plodded north to Council Valley, then crossed eastward over the West Mountain to the area near today's village of Cascade where the settlers headed north again to the Payette Lakes region. Enduring foul weather, lingering snow, and treacherous obstacles, the group finally arrived at the shore of that mountain lake amidst beautiful mountain peaks. The McCalls stayed while the rest of the group turned back to Round Valley. Once arrived, the McCalls' first mission was to find a place to live. Sam Devers, a trapper, was already there, having built and lived in a cabin on the southeast corner of Big Payette Lake. Tom and Louisa viewed the scene and quickly determined that this spot could meet their needs as a home and a place to graze cattle. Sam, possibly persuaded by the severe winter recently passed, negotiated a trade with Tom. Sam's cabin, in claim to 160 acres, for Tom's best wagon and team. The McCall family became permanent residents as Sam quickly left the area. Some other pioneers had arrived at the lakeshore prior to the McCalls to establish their homesteads. One resident, Albert Gakel, a German immigrant shown here, had developed his home site just north of Deaver's homestead. Albert had arrived about five years earlier. He and his family, along with other early arrivals, would remain significant contributors to the early development of the community. Around 1892, Gekel, along with Tom McCall and other early residents, Elba York and Lewis Heacock, constructed the first wooden bridge over the Payette River to connect with the traffic serving the mining communities to the north. The bridge would be in service for nearly two decades, connecting the residents of the east side of the lake to the area on the west side that would be called Lardo. 
As the communities grew, the bridge would be replaced by a metal structure in 1913. In 1894, Tom McCall, with an eye to the future, commissioned a survey with a railroad surveyor to plot the original four square blocks of a future town that would be bordered by 3rd Street on the east, Lake Street on the north, Park Street on the south, and 1st Street on the west. Discrepancies were later corrected by another survey in 1905 by Charles Luck that had formalized these blocks that remain the core of downtown McCall. By the late 1890s, McCall had evolved into a rough and tumble lakeside village. However, the village and the surrounding area had also become a pleasant stopover for passing travelers, and a destination for vacationers looking for the cooling relief from the summer heat of the lower communities of the Treasure Valley. Hotels, campgrounds, and saloons were flourishing. The first hotel in town had been built and owned by Tom McCall and family. The structure, located at the southeast corner of Lake Street and 2nd, according to McCall's new plat, would serve the community for decades before eventually burning down in the 1940s. The hotel transitioned through several owners during its time from the McCall House Hotel to the Hotel Tony, the Hotel Lakeview, and even the Peabody Hotel for a time. Word of the pleasant cool summers, bountiful lakes, and plentiful pastures began to spread. More homesteaders arrived while vacationers came in large numbers. The village was growing. Aeneas Jewsharp Jack Wyatt had begun to advertise tours of to the Payette Lake on a steam-powered boat, the Light Up. His pitch in the Idaho Statesman read, 30-foot sailing yacht for use of parties who might visit the lake. The Light Up was even used later for village celebrations, including the 4th of July. Wyatt provided the service when the Lida was not hauling freight from one end of the Big Payette Lake to the other. The Lida would ply the lake waters for at least two decades. As the turn of the century approached, the McCall family had already developed their homestead into a substantial spread in only a single decade. The McCall family is shown here in front of their original homestead. From left to right are Tom, Louisa, Dawson, Ted, and Ben. The homestead included their home, barns, sheds, and the McCall House Hotel. Tom, Louisa, the son's daughter, and other community members would establish a school where daughter Flora was the first teacher. Tom served as postmaster for a time during those earliest years. He also purchased a sawmill from the Warren Dredging Company that would be the forerunner of the logging and sawmill companies that would sustain the community for much of the 20th century. That earliest sawmill was the source of lumber for all of the early buildings in the village. McCall and the Payette Lakes area became a major draw for tourists. The beauty of the lakes and mountains and the cooler temperatures of the summer attracted families from far away to relax in the idyllic environment. Campgrounds thrived while tourist lodgings popped up all around the lakes. Charles Nelson purchased the land for the Sylvan Beach Resort at the Narrows on the lake. He later added cabins, a hotel, campgrounds for tents, and swimming and boating facilities that would become important to the early tourist industry of the area. Other popular campgrounds were Shady Beach and the Payette Lake Club campgrounds. An enterprising man named Newt Williams had arrived in 1897 by 1900, Newt bought the existing general store from a local resident named Ed McMahon. Newt expanded his mercantile, constructing a larger building at the intersection of First and Lake Streets. Trade flourished. The distinctive profile of the N.F. Williams General Merchandise Store would stand prominently for decades near the lakefront. Newt Williams' success as a community leader and operator of the much-needed store is apparent by their attractive two-story home built near the lakefront. In 1902, W.B. Boydston moved the Lardo Post Office to a point just west of where the lake empties into the Payette River. The site was located near the northbound road, today's Warren Wagon Road, to the mining community of Warrens. For years, Lardo, a stopping point in transit to the mining communities of Bergdorf and Warrens, 
competed with McCall to be the more dominant community. Boydston opened a general store to accommodate the growing population in the area and to supply the traffic from the mining and forestry activities to the northern communities. W.B. built his home, a general store and hotel named the Payette Lakes Hotel near the shoreline. The hotel was dubbed a place to stay and camp on Payette Lake and was the forerunner of the Shore Lodge that later became a McCall area lodging destination for many decades. The next movers and shakers to arrive in the community were Clem and Lenora Francis Blackwell, nicknamed Fanny. The Blackwell family arrived around 1905. Clem first leased the McCall Hotel for a year before building his own hotel and saloon across the street on the southwest corner of 2nd and Lake Street. That's Clem in the forefront and Fanny on the balcony of the newly constructed Blackwell Hotel and Saloon. The Blackwell would become an important watering hole and hotel for McCall during those years. Here's an interior look at Blackwell's bar with Clem standing at the bar. In 1908, the Blackwells built their home on what is now Lenora Street, one block south of the lake. The street was officially named Lenora as a salute to the popular Mrs. Blackwell. Here are Clem and Fanny relaxing on the porch with family members. Clem Blackwell could also be considered an avid sportsman. Around 1910, Clem commissioned a horse track for entertainment. The location was very near the entrance to today's Ponderosa State Park, and race day drew people from all over the region. This appears to be a very close finish. That's Fanny Blackwell with the umbrella cheering on the riders. It's hard to tell whom she is rooting for since two of her sons are among the three riders. Baseball was already popular in McCall in 1909. Clem sponsored the amateur baseball team that defeated a professional minor league team from Walla Walla in an exhibition game. The underdog, McCall 9, won the game against very long odds, resulting in a massive town-wide celebration. Coy Cuddy, back row, third from the right, related the glorious story to his grandson, Steve, decades later. Besides the hotel, saloon, and racetrack, Clem was also the owner of the first meat market, situated in a small building just behind the Blackwell Hotel. The Blackwell Hotel had been constructed between Newt Williams General Store and the McCall Hotel. Lake Street began to take on its eventual personality. Note this 1907 photograph is taken from the sawmill near Tom McCall's property, close to today's Legacy Park. A mill would remain in this position for several decades before moving further north. Looking eastward, also in about 1907, McCall's early home is barely visible at the far end of the street. The townspeople frequently gathered on the lakeside, in front of the original Hotel McCall, with Blackwell's Hotel on the right. Another landmark building was added to Lake Street in 1909. Lake Street Station would be the only important downtown building of the era to survive the entire 20th century without succumbing to fire. Tom McCall and Sons constructed the building with lumber from their mill to provide a headquarters for the U.S. Forest Service. The organization, originally located in Meadows, moved to McCall and would remain in McCall well into the 21st century. In a rare candid photo, Tom and Louisa McCall preside over the 1910 wedding dinner for their son Dawes and brand new daughter-in-law Ennis, seated to Louisa's left. Clearly, the event was well attended by the townspeople. Between 1890 and 1905, the unincorporated village had been referred to as Lake City, Lardo, and even Elo because of the migration of the post offices. In 1905, the post office name was officially changed to McCall, a salute to the village's most prominent family, sawmill operators and hotel owners. On July 19, 1911, the commissioners of Boise County officially incorporated the town of McCall, Idaho. Valley County would not come into existence until six years later. 
1917, the large area encompassed by Boise County at the time was split, and Valley County was established. If you have ever wondered how the citizens of McCall dealt with the prodigious snowfalls before gasoline-powered snowplows, here was a solution. Drivers steered teams of horses through the deep snow to level and compact the snow, as shown here, to more manageable condition. The raised wooden sidewalks of the day nicely accommodated entry to the storefronts as the street levels rose each winter. In 1910, the newly arrived Hans Hoff purchased Tom McCall's rebuilt sawmill and proceeded to expand the operations with the flour mill. However, just two years later, the operation burned down and had to be rebuilt. In 1914, Carl Brown arrived from New England. His initial mission was to check on a property investment on behalf of his father. He decided to remain and eventually partnered with the Hoffs, and the Hoff and Brown Lumber Company was created. In 1930, Carl became the sole owner of the mill, and the company evolved into the Brown Tie and Lumber Company. The mill would grow to contribute to much of the nation's growing demand for lumber and railroad ties, and would become the centerpiece of McCall industry. The Carl and Ida Brown family played a key role in business as the principal employer and as civic leaders during the rest of the 20th century. Carl would even serve as an Idaho state senator in later years. Around 1911, Ida Brown, Louisa McCall, and several ladies of the village, troubled by the number of saloons and other questionable activities in the town, envisioned a clear need for a proper church to combat the wild and woolly nature of the pioneer village. They first organized Lakeshore religious services conducted by visiting ministers. As they brought their dream closer to reality, the group of prominent ladies created the McCall Community Congregational Church in 1912 that would meet each Sunday in the original schoolhouse on 3rd Street. Eventually, the growing membership commissioned the first church building in McCall on land donated by the McCalls. In 1916, the first church in McCall was constructed on the corner of 1st and Park Streets. The first McCall Catholic Church, Our Lady of Perpetual Help, was formed in 1916 and met in the building that would later become the Alpine Playhouse on Roosevelt Avenue. In June 1914, McCall citizens anxiously awaited the arrival of the Idaho Northern Railroad. The railroad line ran from Nampa to Emmett to Horseshoe Bend, then north through Cascade to McCall. In McCall, the tracks ran diagonally through the southern sections of town to a point adjacent to the Hoff and Brown lumber mill on the lake. The railway station, originally dubbed Lakeport by the railroad officials, was soon renamed McCall after considerable confusion and outrage. The original depot and station master's house remained standing even after rail service had stopped, though in slightly different locations along Railroad Avenue near 3rd Street. The arrival of train service opened the floodgates for inbound tourism and supplies while providing an efficient outlet for local lumber and farm products from the valley. The railway was extremely important for timely mail delivery to the backcountry. About the same time as the arrival of the railroad, F.G. Cotterman constructed the elaborate 50-room Pay at Lakes Inn. Situated on a knoll overlooking the lake from the west side, the inn was truly a landmark hotel. Operated as a private club in the beginning, the hotel included a large lobby, impressive grand stairway, two massive fireplaces, a downstairs bar, a lighted boardwalk to the lake, and even a dance barge that was usually moored at the lake's edge. The Pay at Lakes Inn continued to be an important destination until the 1940s. The inn was even used as a resting place for the cast and crew of the Hollywood movie The Northwest Passage which was filmed around McCall in 1937 and 1938. The hotel later became a church camp before being abandoned through the 1990s and early decades of the 21st century. In 2017, the building was nominated to be on the National Register of Historic Places.
A building that would have a notable impact on the future of McCall's tourism was the Canta Building. The structure was first built around 1910 on the edge of Tom McCall's original homestead, where northbound 3rd Street intersects with westbound Lake Street. At the time, the building housed a restaurant, rooms for rent, a butcher shop, and an office for the Forest Service. This later photograph of the snow-covered Canta building at the lake shows the McCall Meat Company on the north end of the building and the Lakeside Hotel on the south end. The Hoff and Brown Lumber Company is visible in the rear. In 1919, William Deinhardt purchased the Canta building and opened the Hotel McCall. The earlier hotel, built by Tom McCall to the west on Lake Street, had by then been renamed the Lakeview Hotel. Deinhardt expanded and improved the building, adding dormers to the roof to upgrade the rooms upstairs. The newer Hotel McCall can be seen here in a photo taken in the 1930s. In 1937, the building burned to the ground, and soon Deinhardt rebuilt what would be the core structure of today's Hotel McCall. In 1911, the first automobile arrived in McCall. By 1914, the number of Model T Fords on the road had grown substantially throughout the nation. For the automobiles of the day, the road from Boise was treacherous and required most of the day to navigate. The ferry crossing at Smith's Ferry that preceded Rainbow Bridge was now handling cars as well as horse-drawn vehicles. Note the pine tree in the middle of Lake Street. That tree remained there until the mid-1930s. Goodman's Garage would fulfill the growing demand for gasoline-powered traffic. The filling station and store were situated on the north side of Lake Street, across from the Lakeview Hotel. 1920, downtown McCall from the balcony of Blackwell's Hotel shows how automobiles and tourism were changing the appearance of Lake Street. Here we see autos preparing for the long drive home while queuing up to refuel at Goodman's Station on the left. In a mere 30 years, McCall's lakefront pioneer village had transformed into a busy and hectic destination. Parking appears to have been a challenge even then. McCall's first official winter carnival was held on February 29th to March 1st of 1924 to bring new excitement to McCall's lengthy winters. The event consisted of ice sculptures and organized dog sled races in honor of the sled dogs that had been used to carry the United States mail when the snow was too deep to use horses. There had been some earlier local winter festivities as far back as 1915, as shown here in a Gakel family photo. Note that all the McCall winter carnivals back then were held on the frozen lake. Grandpa Shaw, a prominent citizen from just south of town, is shown here giving ski lessons to local citizens. Ski jumping was held on Clem Blackwell's Hill. Town businesses contributed money for the purses that were awarded to the winners. The Oregon Short Line Railroad even made arrangements for special trains with sleeper cars for the run to McCall. Longtime McCall citizen Marie Strode remembered there was much behind the scenes direction by Tom Dad McCall himself. All the dog sled, snowshoe, and ski jarring races were held on a circular track out on the frozen lake in full view of the south shoreline at all times. Almost 2,000 merrymakers came for the sports and partying that first year, including Governor Moore. The huge toboggan slide running along the east side of 2nd Street and onto the lake ice was a huge attraction. Since its founding, McCall Airport has served as a gateway to other parts of the region and the state of Idaho. It all began in 1926, according to lifelong resident Marie Strode, when Austin Goodman bought 40 acres south of McCall from her grandfather, Clem Blackwell, and grubbed out the sagebrush to make an airport. Goodman later donated the airfield to the city of McCall, which soon added another 40 acres. This early 1930s photograph shows the original airport, including the first structure, the Pioneer Hangar. That structure remained and housed local flying services for decades. In the 1930s, Johnson's Flying Service expanded its operations from Missoula to McCall. 
Led by Bob Johnson, shown here, its pioneer pilots and aircraft provided essential services to mining and timber companies, the U.S. Forest Service, tourists, and remote backcountry settlements. In 1940, the U.S. Forest Service, working with Johnson's Flying Service, spent the summer studying and practicing smoke jumping at the training site in the Bitterroots. Later that year, the Forest Service began using smoke jumpers for fire suppression. And in 1943, smoke jumpers began operations from McCall. Today, the smoke jumper base in McCall is one of the largest in the Northwest. By 1930, the Great Depression had hit the nation and McCall. Times were tough as tourism waned and local tourist destinations suffered. Resident Martha Chitwood recalled, My mother taught and in the summertime sold her chickens and eggs to summer visitors and raised strawberries to sell in town just to make ends meet. Times were very difficult. In 1930, Carl Brown took full ownership of the mill and it became known as the Brown Tie and Lumber Company. As the economy leaned into the depression, Brown's mill and timber business was the leading payroll for the town. The other mainstay was the U.S. Forest Service. Carl Brown did everything he could to keep his employees and to help the town. The four Hoff brothers stayed with him as well. He helped his workers to build homes so they would stay with him. He supported the schools in many ways, but even the teachers needed extra income. While much of the nation suffered during the 1930s, fortunes of McCall were improving in many ways, spurred on by the advent of President Franklin Roosevelt's Civilian Conservation Corps. Beginning in 1933, the CCC placed several camps in the region. Many roads and other public works were completed. The 22 miles of the Salmon River Road were a particular challenge with its almost perpendicular sides. Walls and bridges were crafted of stone. The Riggins and French Creek camps built two suspension bridges, both over 200 feet in length and high above the water. The CCC built lookout towers and houses, dozens of dams and miles of telephone lines. Several local men became supervisors or foremen for these camps. Stands of timber were improved. Lumber from Brown's Mill was used to build the camps. Local businesses supplied food and local produce. McCall became a favorite rest destination for many of the eastern and southern boys who came to work in these camps. Some stayed for the rest of their lives, enamored with the fishing in the lakes and hiking in the rugged mountains of the backcountry. Long-standing evidence of the work of the CCC is the Central Idaho Historical Museum, where now eight of the buildings are listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Situated on four acres near the center of McCall, the museum consists of buildings constructed by the Civilian Conservation Corps in 1937 for the Southern Idaho Timber Protective Association, SITPA. The log buildings served as headquarters and were intended to showcase the skills of local Finnish carpenters. Projects were supervised by Art Roberts, who was the fire warden during that time. He later became McCall's longest serving mayor with a term of 20 years. As skiing and ski jumping increased in popularity, Carl Brown, with encouragement from his son Warren, donated 80 acres situated three miles west of McCall to the U.S. Forest Service to be used as an official ski area. The Payette Lake Ski Club was formed, and Norwegian Olympic ski jumper Corey Engen became the first manager and instructor. The 1,200-foot lift was created from two large wooden sleds on a shuttle, designed and built by Joe Casper, Carl Brown's millwright. In addition to the Nordic and Alpine ski runs, a 60-meter ski jump was constructed. The runs and all the facilities were built by local volunteers and the CCC crews. This single location and after-school ski programs eventually produced six Winter Olympic skiers.
In June of 1938, an MGM crew arrived to film the background footage of McCall's beautiful forests and mountains for the feature movie Northwest Passage, adapted from the novel by Kenneth Roberts. MGM leased the entire Sylvan Beach as the studio camp. In the late spring of 1939, construction crews came to build the sets. In July, the cast and crew of 250 arrived in McCall aboard the train with 12 freight cars loaded with props and sets for filming Northwest Passage. About 1,000 Native Americans from seven reservations portrayed the various northeastern tribes of the story. Noted actors Spencer Tracy, Walter Brennan, and Robert Young appeared in this production. The female leads were Isabel Jewell and Helen McKellar. During the filming, a small dam on the upper Payette River was breached as 225 local volunteer rangers formed a human chain to cross the river. The set for one part of the movie was comprised of a fort and 120 cabins and teepees covering 10 acres, outfitted with gas jets and igniting devices to create a spectacular blaze. The entire McCall division of the CCC stood by to prevent the fires from spreading. In the final scene, 250 members of the Idaho State Militia were recruited from forest fire duty in Oregon to portray the defeated British forces. In many physical ways, McCall has clearly changed during its first century. But the pioneering spirit and love of the outdoors still remain in the citizens of the area. As the city continues to grow, it is important that the future residents recall the sense of pride and dedication to their beautiful environment that the early residents shared. Well, Louisa McCall, Tom's wife, when asked later in life if she had ever become discouraged during the difficult early years, the harsh winters, and the personal sorrows, she responded. Why, well, no, of course not. I had my family here with me. Besides, there was always the lake and the mountains, the grand trees and the sunshine. And when I got a little discouraged, I used to walk out to a place just above the lake and look across that glorious beauty. And that was all I needed. <laughs>